But what Paul talks about is relationship. Husband and wives, parents and children, master and slaves, or today, boss and employee. Yeah? And that is so important for us to understand. Now, Paul doesn't go very into detail with all that wives and husband, all that. It is a very short passage. It's only seven verses in chapter, the remaining chapters. We are doing verse 18 to verse 25, and then two verses in chapter 4, okay, to conclude it nicely for that passage. So it's only nine verses, nine verses. So Paul only talks about this number of lines about husband and wife, all that. So he doesn't go right into detail in it because if you want to know more detail about how husband and wife should be, you should read Ephesians chapter 5. Very long, verse 22 to 33. Yep, I remember that very well because part of my test in Bible school was to memorize it word for word. And our lecturer was like, husbands, blank, 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 wives, blank, blank, blank. And that's the worst kind of test you can ever take. You know, because it's like you've got to get it right, literally, of every single part. But what is Paul trying to say here? Because he goes back to one first, the first key thing he has always stated in Colossians. What is Colossians' key? The word Christ. Nothing else. If you forget everything, Colossians is about Christ. Nothing else. In Christ. And so he talks about what we call identity in Christ. Now you're in Christ, how do you relate as husband and wife? Now that you're in Christ, children and parents. Now that you're in Christ, master and slave, boss and employees. How do you relate? And that is so important. Let me, let me put these three points to you. You must understand these three points, then the rest of it very easy. Save my saliva also. Okay? You understand it's about in Christ, then you get number one. Okay? Your identity is in Christ, regardless of the role that you have. We all have roles that we play. Yeah. Correct? You are a wife to your husband, for example. You are also a daughter to your parents. But you are also a mother to your child. And if you are working, you are a manager in office. So you have different roles. We live in a society where there are structures, organizations and roles that are you know, in the marketplace, in the world itself, where you and I are positioned in and where we are in. Some structures and setups are created by God to reveal His glory to us. Some structures are neutral. Some structures are abused or you know, it's not working right that needs change and that's why you went for election. Right? You forgot yesterday, okay? <laughs> But these are all structures that we have in this world. For better or for worse, you like, don't like, this is part of the world we live in. You say, no, I go somewhere else, it's the same kind of structures called by any other name. All of us have different roles to play, but your identity ultimately is in Christ, regardless of the role you play. Whether you're a father, mother, boss, employee, whether you're a child, your identity first is in Christ. Do I get myself, get you right now, right here? Everybody understand? Your identity is in Christ, okay? Number two, your identity in Christ does not erase your role. Okay, just now that you are in Christ, it does not negate your role as mother, boss, spouse. You have a role to play. But what we are saying is your role does not define you. You know, understand what I mean? You in Christ is the, fine, the most important definition. If you understand, you know, if you don't understand who you are in Christ, you can get into an abusive relationship with your husband, uh, marriage and where your spouse look at you and say you're an idiot every day. But to you, I'm in Christ and in Christ, I'm not an idiot. In Christ, I made the head and not the bottom. In Christ, I made the head, not the tail. In Christ, my enemy comes one way and flees seven ways. In your eyes, you might think I'm a fool. But in Christ, that's who I am. And that's so important to know. We live in a world where more and more the world looks at you as Christians and say, you guys are pain. Because they will not accept the values and the standards that God has. And it's so important for us to know that who your identity is in Christ. So the first point I said, 
Your identity is in Christ, regardless of your role. Okay, number two, your identity in Christ does not erase your role. Because there are many Christians who like to cop out of their role. They say, oh, Pastor, can you pray? I want to change job. My office is terrible. People. Everybody swear one. You work in the world. Uh, which part of the world don't swear? Hello? No, I want to work in this Christian company because every Friday they sing Kumbaya one. You know, the full gospel businessmen, the Christian businessmen, all come, you know, so nice. You see, when you go to a place full of likes, yeah, even here we never own all the likes, not to save electricity, it's just very blur, too many likes. When you go with a place where all the likes are there and you are like there, you will decide that let somebody be the bright spark and you, you, you dim your light. Ah, yeah. So many Christians there, no need to say so much. Ah. Somebody will pray one, somebody will give thanks one, somebody will do ah, nice things. I just sit there. But if you are in a company where there are not many Christians and you are there, guess what likes are for? They are called to shine in darkness. Where likes are needed? Places where they are dark. And if you are in a nation, if you are in an office, if you are in a school, in a college, in a neighborhood where you could be in a minority, you are called to be the salt of the earth and light of the world. In a place where there's too much salt, it's terrible to eat. That's why the Bible, pretty smart, right God? Because in a church there's too much salt. You need to go and make disciples. Hello? Well, salty statement, don't catch it. Yeah? We need to go. You stay too long together, you don't go and make disciples, you shine brightly in each other's eyes, and you miss the whole point what God wants to do. Yeah? And thirdly, since your identity is in Christ, and that does not negate your role, your identity in Christ defines how you engage your role. Very important. Now it's basic. You say, Pastor, this one's so basic. It is so basic that we nearly every time camp uh, have the same kind of topic. You say, Pastor, why you school people? If our topic is, you are a masterpiece, what does that mean? In Christ. Uh. You have purpose. What does that mean? In Christ. Uh. You have been set free. What does that mean? In Christ. Uh. Every camp topic also, that one. It looks good on your t-shirt. But it doesn't look good in our brains because it has not transferred in our heart and it has never come out in our behavior. So we repeat it again and again. The same topics. So as a pastor, I fail in teaching church. And you say, ah, cell leaders say, ah, pastor, liar. And you as cell leaders fail too. And he said, yeah, you see? And you as Christians fail to read the Bible. These are basic things in Christ. If it is in Christ, it defines how you engage the world. And that is something we need to know. And more and more, you will find this challenge. If you ask people like Hannah, Yo, Michelle, and all that who are in the marketplace, who are in the politics, they will tell you, who they are in Christ will direct their behavior in engaging in how they do things. And likewise, the same thing if you are a teacher, if you are a businessman, how, who you are in Christ defines how you carry out your business ethics and your attitude out in the world. Correct? No? Yes? But you say that's a different thing. Church is church. Monday, I can cheat, lie. Then that is a challenging thing to what you understand in Christ because on Monday you switch off Christ somehow Jesus Christ is just a USB thumb drive that you plug in on Sunday and saying you alone yeah hallelujah and then Monday Sunday 12 o'clock midnight oh they're all I'm in the world now but the Bible reminds us though we are in the world but we are not of this well, and so today we talk about building godly relationships in these three areas. If we understand our identities in Christ, 
it does not negate or erase the role that we have out there in the world, but rather it tells you how to engage the world in our structures that we are placed in, then we can understand today's message. Amen. In fact, actually, if you understand this, then actually the rest part no need. Lah. Now, let me go quickly here. Paul is using the illustration of his world then. Today, we live in a society who are all extra smart, especially the younger people, I'm not talking about you, who are in the woke cancel culture thing, who look at history, whether it's 10 years ago, 15 years, 20 years, 1,000, 2,000 years ago, and came to the conclusion that they should have known better. Because if it was them, they would never have done that. If it was then, during the Romans and Greek times, they would have won underwear. They should have known better. And one fine day, you as grandparents will turn around to your kids. You should have known better last time. You studied better in the SPM and get a better job. You see, it is always easy to look back and judge by today's standard and say they shouldn't. And one of the biggest things today is what we call slavery. See, see, Bible, slave, you know. Back in those days, slaves had no color. One. The Romans were really interested in color. I conquer your country. And whatever people are there, red and yellow, blue and white, you're all my slaves. That's all. As far as the Romans are concerned, we conquer you, we are the boss. You slave. That's it. Nothing to do with color, nothing to do with anything else, but rather you submit to me because we are your conquerors. So understand this, okay? So we are looking at a Roman society. We are looking at the illustration Paul is in. He is in a Roman world. He is not in a Chinese world. In fact, if this was in China, you will also have slaves. In fact, some of them are called eunuchs. Yeah? And those of you who are wondering, really, uh, in the Bible, people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were also slaves. No? They didn't go to Babylon on their own free will, right? If people drag you there, you are not going there by your own free will. They didn't apply for a passport, you were brought there. Okay? And given a job, whether you like it or not. Yeah? And that is called slave. So read Bible, eyes uh, must open a bit, and don't read by today's standard. Okay? So when we look at Roman class system, it is important to understand they had a number of... Uh, just in society here, lah. Here in Malaysia, T20, B, M40, and B40. In Rome, you have the emperor and royal family. You have the patrician, which is the upper class people, and then you have the senators who discuss law and make law. And then you have the equestrians. That is not about riding horse, and they were the knights. Some of them were former soldiers who uh, who had horses, obviously. <laughs> okay, and they were had a certain nobility. Some of them down the line became procurator or governor. Okay? And then you have also the, what we call the free men um, or the plebeians. These ordinary folks who were free. Yeah? They could be merchants, they could be just farmers, basic simple people, but they were free. They were not slaves. Yep. And then you also had freed men who were slaves but freed by the owners much later on. Yeah, with very little rights. And obviously most at the bottom line, you always have the slaves. So slaves was a big thing. In fact, if you not, didn't know, Rome is said they had 1 million people staying there, out of which 300,000 over are slaves. So there is a lot of slaves in uh, that time. In fact, in the Battle of Epirus in 167 BC, Rome defeated that place and they took 150,000 slaves. So slave was a normal thing. Then you can look at today and say, how atrocious. Yes, back in those days, people were atrocious. That's the reality of life. Okay? Uh, so that is the Roman world. In the Roman world, why I'm giving you background, so you understand clearly how Paul addresses it. Because people who look today will say, why doesn't he do reformation and change it? Yeah? It's a bit difficult to change a culture that has been set just by one man. And when Christianity wasn't welcome in the Roman Empire. All he did was to preach the gospel so that people can first be transformed within 
And when they are transformed, they reach others one by one and transform. And we see that transformation happen because down the line, Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. Yeah. But it requires work and prayer. It requires a man's sacrifice to go from town to town, city to city, to the ends of the earth. It requires the early church to suffer for Christ. So it's easy to shout revolution and reformation in that sense without thinking of the condition that is there. So in the Roman society, you have what we call the paterfamilias, where the oldest man in the household is the boss, whether it's a father or grandfather. He has absolute power, everything. So even if uh, you want to marry, the man in the house decides. It is very Chinese. <laughs> you know Chinese olden days? Unless the TV show made a wrong show, like, you know, the old TV show, right? They always show the, the father is going to say, you're going to get married to this. I don't care whether you like it, you have to marry. Yeah? So back in those days, the same Roman family set up by this one man. He owns everything. Okay, so everything, even the wives, are considered as chattel in the sense that they were there to basically breed heirs. Okay, and be there to take care of household, make sure the slaves are fine. So families were core center of Roman economy because you have cottage industries, you have things that are happening, yeah, in, in that, and, and form strong families, form strong government and strong empires. Likewise, strong families in church form strong church. If at your core of your own family, you don't pray and don't read the Bible, and when we gather together, we have a bunch of church people who don't pray and read the Bible. Get what I'm saying? So that is, that is important. So when we understand this, when we look at what Paul is trying to say here, dealing with marriage, the wife is not seen in as today's concept of people fall in love. Like someone they just announced they got engaged. Yeah. And uh, they fall in love. And now, you know, uh, they got into, they're going to get into marriage because of love. Back in those days, nothing to do with love. It has to do with arrangements, sometimes political arrangements, business arrangements, and family arrangements. Good for our family, your family, my married family, and then that's it. So wives were basically, if we call it chattel, property. Even kids were considered as property. The father will say, you take care of the farm, you go there and do my business, you. And in fact, the father, the paterfamilias, can actually kill anyone in his family and he has the judicial right to do that, but seldom being carried out. So you understand the absolute power of the head of the house. Okay? So that is the setup of the Roman family. Uh, okay, sorry for history. Eh? Sounds like New Testament survey class. Okay, that is the Roman society, as you can see it. So, first thing is so important for us to be, let Jesus be the center of your marriage. So, the scripture says this, Wives, submit yourself to your husband as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. That only those two lines, nothing else. Yep. Compared to Ephesians. So, in Colossians, he says, Wives, submit to your husband as fitting in the Lord. And husbands, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. Now, this is very directing because Paul, if you look at the three structures and people group here, he addresses the weaker vessel first. You realize that? Because in the olden days, you always talk to the man. You don't address the woman. Paul is breaking the structure norm here by addressing the woman first. You get what I'm saying? He might sound subtle, but that is how he chooses to approach it. He doesn't speak to the man, but he says, wives, submit to your husband. But it doesn't mean husband, you know, you do the other way of just seeing her as a property. You love your wife. See, there is a role to be played. I will explain further. But in Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 33, tells us further, where Paul lengthens it further. He says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit to their husband in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. 
In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So husband, if you don't love your wife, guess what it means? You don't love yourself long. I didn't say that. I'm just putting it there what the Bible says. Yeah? After all, no one has ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must, must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Amen? Okay, so when we talk about submit to authority, the word is hupotaso. The word hupotaso basically means under Tasso means arrange. That means to basically subject or subordinate in yourself, literally place under rank to someone who is superior in rank to you. So the best picture to understand is in an army. Okay? Uh, for example, if you watch those army, right, you have the staff sergeant who always train the soldiers and he will be screaming in their face. Oh, I remember one of my lecturers who used to be an army soldier said when he was in the army, you know, uh, the, his sergeant's, staff sergeant's name was Noah. Not Noel, Noah. He says, he says, my name is Sergeant Noah. And my wife's name is Mrs. Noah. Guess who the animals are? <laughs> Don't catch it right slow. Right? <laughs> Don't catch it. <laughs> he told the soldiers, look, I'm Noah, my wife is Mrs. Noah. And guess who are, the, who are the animals? You guys are. Okay? But down the line, some of them became captain, some of them became major, right? Now, this sergeant is more experienced than any of them. But while they were under his command, right, he outranked them. But down the line, they became captain and major, even though they were younger than him and less experienced in terms of soldiering compared to his years. He saluted them. Because in rank, they were higher than him. It doesn't make him less qualified. It doesn't make him less a soldier. It's just that in the order of an army, that is the rank that is being placed. And therefore, in God's kingdom, God sets the husband to be the head. Because in any movies, when you go and watch a movie and you bring your children there, and suddenly something comes up on the screen that has two heads, you will say to your ch child, Ah dear, that is a monster. Right? Yes. It can happen in political scenario when you have two heads. And I think it's a Chinese who say you cannot have two tigers standing on the same hill. <laughs> yeah? Anything that has two heads, obviously, you're not sure, it is always called a monster. If you don't want a monster in your home, then down the line, there needs to be an order. And God is a God of order. In His order, He placed that. And so, husbands, it is important for you to understand your role in playing that. Okay, submission does not mean, women, you are worthless. In fact, you know, some women are much better than their husbands. Sorry, uh, guys, I have to know lunch for me, Ray. You are inf doesn't mean you are inferior. doesn't mean a husband is absolute authority, you know. Here, your submission is ultimately to Christ. And it's part of your submission to Christ when you submit to your husband. Yeah. Now remember this. Submission is, women, you only submit to your husband, not to any other man. The Bible doesn't tell you that. Okay? You only submit to your husband. Now, I would like to say one more thing that might be controversial. The Bible says in verse earlier we read, Husbands, love your wife. Do not treat them harshly. You do not submit to tyranny. Very important. Okay, there are, I disagree with some Christians who believe even if you are being abused, God has called you to be in debt and we will pray for you. If you are being abused, women... I will ask you to make a police report and get a lawyer. Get out of the marriage. 
get out of that place at the moment. He said, Pastor, are you breaking up the marriage? No, don't cough. I'm saving somebody. Then reconciliation can at least be worked at when there is room and space to be dealt with. Not leaving a person in that place and using the word submission. The Bible tells us to not treat someone harshly. Submission is not to tyranny. Submission is to love. You need to get it right. Okay? And Lord, I heard Christians say, oh no, we just pray for sister so and so, she's in that situation. You know, we can't ask her to come out, Pastor, because that's not what God wants. Do you want to take her place now? Substitute lah. Tell the husband, I take her place. Give her a break. You abuse her, and I'm willing to be abused. Come. You don't, right? So I think common sense is, you say, oh, really? Well, Malachi says that I don't, you know, don't treat your wife of young in violence. Violence is a thing that we should look at today as a church. Now I know it comes online and some people say, and some people might just type online, really? Yeah, I always tell this, if you have a lot of things to say, you put up your hand and say, I'm willing to take your place for a week. Mental abuse, emotional abuse, all that. We have to seriously look at it. Standing outside and say, yeah, sister, I pray for you. Pray for you is one thing. Yeah? If someone goes to hospital, we need to always understand submission is not to tyranny. It is to love. Are you saying the husband in the name of Jesus should treat the wife that way? And that he is in Christ and Jesus is the silent guest in your house and when the husband goes and Jesus says, Get up, man. Are you saying that? If we are saying that as a church, then we shouldn't be a church. You get it? It's very important to say. Paul doesn't say much because he has no time to write so much about husband and wife. But he says very simple here, okay? Husbands, love your wife and do not be harsh with them. Why? Because in a Roman society, the head of the house do not need to listen to any ideas or thoughts from you. You are under me. And now to break that mold, he says, Husbands, love your wife. He said, how is it possible? Because in Christ, you can love. The whole point, remember when I say everything? It is in Christ that now determines and tells you how you engage your role in society. And that is so important. Amen? So when we talk about submission, it is voluntary and sacrificially putting yourself in your proper place under a person with a rightful position of authority over you for the sake of harmoniously accomplishing the Lord's work. Amen? So biblical submission isn't yielding to your husband's will. It's embracing the order Christ established and submitting to Christ. Therefore, everything that you do in word and in deed, as verse 17 says, do it unto in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's very important right now when you think, when you do, what you say in a relationship is to be done in the name of Jesus. And if you are saying that Jesus approves it, then by all means do it. <laughs> Which I don't think that any of us can justify harshness, violence, tyranny. Amen? Silence, huh? Dangerous. Don't know what's going in your head. Let me put it further here. Ephesians tells us the mystery of Christ and the church. Christ is the bridegroom, correct? And the church is the bride. Amen? So, husbands, you are to image Christ to your wife and the world. Wow, that is hard. And wife, you are to image church, the church. Uh, the image, the church, and her love for the bridegroom to the same world. That, that is how it is. 
that's where the picture is, is how God wants it to be done. I mean, who wouldn't, I think all of us would agree, right? I think the ladies can buy me lunch. That who wouldn't want a husband who acts like Jesus would all the time in your relationship, in your marriage? I'm not, I'm not a wife. All the women don't want to buy me lunch. And all the husbands would say, how sweet it would be if a wife responded to him as we, the church, should respond to Jesus all the time, lovingly, obediently. <laughs> Correct? So both sides also, we have imperfection side. <laughs> That's the reality of it. Husbands, you are to image the bridegroom. So why husbands would say, ah, you see, it's submit, but you have to image Christ. Are you doing that? Will you die? Will you give sacrificially, lovingly? Would you forgive? Everything that Jesus did. And likewise, the other part of it. Would you obediently follow as you would obediently follow Jesus as a church? Lovingly, giving sacrificially and all that. The same relationship as husband and wives, bridegroom and the bride. And that imagery is hard to live out. We can talk about it, but a lot of times we don't realize what Paul is trying to say here. In a marriage, we are called to reflect Christ on the husband's side and on the wife's side to reflect the church, reluctance, uh, obedience and, and, and relationship to Jesus Christ. Then there is oneness. Amen. As Paul talked very short about this, I will stop talking about this. <laughs> yeah, so bridegroom, right? So the scripture, let me read it again. Wives, submit to your, yourself to your husband as fitting in the Lord. Fitting in the Lord. Understand? So husbands, you can never lead your wife to sin. Then she has every justification to say, I will not follow. Okay? So, one of the simplest things is be assem assembled together with other believers and keep the Sabbath holy. So, simple things like come to church law. Yeah. If your husband says, I don't want to go to church anymore. On Sunday is the day I play golf and after that you can go somewhere pyramid. Then the wife don't have to listen to you. La. That is your problem with God. Yeah? So, look at that. Think about that, huh? Okay, Jesus be the center in your family. Now, again, I say wives are also, you know, not to be hurt. Children, lucky not to be hurt in the Roman society. But guess what? Paul talks to the children first. He talks to the vehicle vessels first. He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Olama! Terrible, huh? He didn't mention the mothers. I thought it was the mothers are the one who are supposed to take care of the children. Jalana, I'm not saying myself also. Lah. So I appreciate my wife. She takes care of my daughter. I'm always not around. <laughs> fathers. Fathers, you know. Not mothers. Paul addresses the fathers. You know why he addresses the father? Because you are the head of the household. Ma. You want to be head, right? You want to be Tainamiana. You want to be there one, right? Uh, then you better do something about it. Lah. Yep. So children, obey your parents in everything. Yep. We are called to obey. Now, Paul gives a responsibility to you as children. Now, in this place, there are young children, there are growing up children, and there are old children. Old in the sense, your parents are 90 and you are 60 plus. So you're old, but you're still children in that relationship. Yep. And sometimes in that situation, you know, it's a bit hard to obey because... They might not know what they want to do because you are taking care of them, okay? That, that is a reality of life. And one of these days, we will be in that position. But children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Your obedience, hear what Paul is saying, now that this family is in Christ, you who are children, obey. I'm talking to you first because you have that role. You have the responsibility of playing your role in that family so that as a family in Christ, you'll be a testimony to a world of a not perfect family, but a family that has Christ that who now works through their imperfection 
to show how a people whose God is Him can live. People who need mercy and grace. And that's where we are. We're not saying our family is perfect. You know, everybody, we sit there in the house, spotless, clean. No, la, you ask everybody here. Not many people want to open their house or cell group. You know why? Because you have to clean the whole house before everybody come. Correct or not? Yeah, that's why not many people open a house. Ah. They say you can open a church, you know, because of a cleaner. Ma. But open a house, you have to clean first, the rush back, clean everything, toilet have to clean, everything. How you wish that people could just come. But you cannot also, ma, right? Because you have to keep your face. I remember mean, talking about me. La. We were right. The house had to be very clean, ma. And most guys actually don't bother. Ah, never mind, never mind. And all the wives will be like, what? Get on. Yes? See, all the wives shaking your head, yeah. And all the men say, what's a big deal? Boy, you just come in, lah. Right? Probably Shem will say, yeah, what's the big deal, boy? <laughs> and Gabby will be like, what? But that's, that's part of the behavior of men. But children, you have a part to play. Obey your parents. And all the more you are in Christ, they know much more of the things of the Lord. Hopefully, I pray fully. As parents, you know much more than your children in the things of the Lord. And so they obey you, trusting in your leadership as longer believers in the Lord so that you can direct them in the way that they should grow. I mean, every dedication say, do you train your child, raise your child in the way that he should go, right? So as children, you are obeying, trusting that your parents who are in Christ are in a growing relationship with Christ and that the decisions they make, you know, you can learn from them for better or for worse. Yeah, they are not perfect, your parents, but your role is to trust and obey them because Jesus says, this is the best way to go. Amen? But if your parents are asking you to do something sinful, then I will tell you, you don't have to do that. Lah. That would be terrible. Okay? And fathers, the scripture says, do not embitter. In other words, do not irritate. It doesn't mean that you won't irritate them or embitter them because there are things that you do them they will never like. For example, if you spank them or ground them. Correct, our parents? They don't like that. Lah. They get irritated. You get embittered. Yeah? You, you switch off the internet or cut off the phone line, they will not be happy. But what it means here is that constant nagging and irritating thing that goes on. And again, you keep saying, to the point, ultimately, they feel that, you know, you don't trust them, you, you see them as fools, you don't trust, and you don't see them as responsible people. So it gets to the point. So when it comes to that point, that's what Paul is saying, do not make them bitter. Because bitterness is something that eats at you and it will destroy your relationship. Amen? So remember, in a family, we are all heirs in Christ. Father, mother, and your children, you are all heirs in Christ. But in a family set up in a structure, yes, you have parents and children. But in Christ, you are all heirs in Christ. You are fellow servants in Christ. But children, you are younger. You are walking along those who have gone ahead of you in their faith. And we pray that as a family, you will grow together. Amen? So don't provoke. Lastly, Jesus in your workplace. Understand that slaves and masters were a real thing. Okay? Slaves, obey your earthly master in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. For whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Master, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Okay? Now, as I say, when we come to this topic, in today's view, based on current situations happening in U.S. and other parts of the world, everybody gets caught up with the word slavery. But if you look at history, slavery was a norm thing in society back then. In fact, in, among the Chinese themselves, you have. I don't know, know whether you all know the, the, the thing called Mujai. 
have, have you ever seen a Mui Chai before? No. I think my grandmother had a Mui Chai. <laughs> you know, there are people who not, not as a result of uh, act of war and whatever comes into that position. You could even be kidnapped, for example, you decided to take a boat to go for election and then the pirates came and then you were sold off as a slave. That happens back in those days. Yep, you were out on the road, uh, bandits came, they took you and your family and you were sold off as that. Yep. Or Rome conquered you, you were taken into that as boys of war and you, will come, you become slaves working in a farm or in the mines or sold off. So it doesn't matter to them whether you are red, yellow, blue and white as far as you are under them as far as you're concerned. Yep. And there are some people are in slavery due to uh, they have no money to pay, so they sell themselves into to a master. So that gives them safety, protection for their family, because at least they work for a good master, got housing, yeah, got protection, got food to eat. And then when they die, their children continue working there. Mui uh, Chai I mean, is some people, back in those days, you have someone who comes in the family and works there for the rest of their life for the family and uh, consider part of the family. But technically, if you want to say, understand that they are servant, and I wouldn't want to say they are slaves, but the understanding they basically put themselves into the family. Yeah. Uh, why I say my grandmother had, because I remember calling a lady in her household by one name only when I was growing up. Mujai. I don't know her name. I never knew her name. Her name was Mujai. But... Chinese New Year, she got some food. Holiday, she also went with the family. She was considered part and parcel of the family. But she did all the chores. She came to the family as, you know, I don't know, long history. Lah. I do not know, no idea. Because when I was, grew up at the time, they say, ah, Hui Chai. That's the name I call. I never knew. Actually, I ran and realized, I look at all the names called when I was young. It has nothing to do with their real name one. I never knew what their real name was. It's just a name given, called by the family. Okay? And so we have that situation uh, in the Roman times, slaves and master. Now, a lot of people say, hey, Paul didn't do much about it. Well, we see in the letter to Philemon, he tried to deal with it and says to Philemon on the issue of Onesimus, the slave that you know, uh, ran away. Okay? When... when when they brought the letter to the church in Colossae, they also brought a letter to Philemon. Okay? Onesimus was traveled along with Tysiscus on that. And so you can see the issue that Paul writes to the master and says, look, you are now in Christ. You know, treat your slave like a brother in Christ. Yeah? Treat him fairly. Treat him well. And yes, if he doesn't do his job, then yes, you have every right to, to, do, to do what you are supposed to but if he's doing it right, he's doing it well, treat him like a brother, treat him like one of us in the body of Christ. Because he is now, you know, your fellow heir in Christ. Even though you are a master and he is your servant or slave. And so you can see that changes. We don't know whether in their cell group back then, uh, the master and the slave were in the same room. We don't know, possibly. Because they all attended the same church. Just like some of us might have your boss and your employee in the same church. Yeah? In today's concept, we might not understand slaves and masters that well. But it, it still happens all over the world. That's the reality of it. And so today, master and slave, we call boss and employee. La. For the eight hours you work, technically you're kind of slave under them. <laughs> in one sense. While well, all the boss look at me and say like, no... But they own your hours there, basically. And for that payment and remuneration, you have to work there. And whatever they say, they own it. Of course, after that, some boss also try to control your life. Lah. Midnight also, they send it to you. Yeah. But we have a different setup in today. In employee, employee. How do we carry ourselves in that? And Paul says, basically, if you're an employer, in Christ, it tells you how to treat your worker. And if you're an employee in Christ, it tells you how to behave in your office. In everything the Bible says, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't care. It's the same thing. Yeah? 
It's the same thing. The values of God has to be lived out in your place. And if you work in any company or a marketplace, you do it with a spirit of excellence. Not perfectionism. That means with the right attitude and the right spirit. You do it, as Paul says, not to curry favor. Only work when the boss sees you. The boss not there, you don't work. I remember a missionary was telling a story how you know, he was frustrated when he, in the early back days, I was reading it, and, and when he went to some country, and the natives there were pretty lazy. He tried to get them to work, and whenever he walked off, they were all lazing around. And one day he was frustrated, and he had an eyeball thing. So he, he took his eyeball because there was some issue. He took it out and placed it on the stump of a tree. Then he went off. And so all these people saw the eyeball that was on the stump, and they all started to work, thinking the eyeball was a magic thing. And he was watching them even though he was not around. You know, like a CCTV? Yep. But then he thought, now i got a good way to make sure that they are working all the time, even though I'm not there. I just put my eyeball there. Then suddenly, a few days later, he saw that they were not working. Because evidently, some smart native went crawling behind the stump and cover the eye with a head. Now thinking that he cannot see, so they can now all play when the cat is not around. <laughs> you see? And so if you, that's how you are working in your office. When the boss is not around, hey, Facebook, play games. That's it. Yeah? If you curry favor only when the boss is around, then you have a wrong relationship. You have a wrong spirit in doing your job. I'm sure all the college students here know such, especially when you have group projects. <laughs> Those who never appear until tomorrow is the submission day. <laughs> then they appear just to put their name on the paper and say, I also did it. <laughs> yeah, I can ask all the college students how frustrated they are. <laughs> In fact, if they were not Christians, they could do something violent. <laughs> Correct? And they all don't say anything, right? All very pretend. Be quiet. But that's the reality of the world. If you are curring favor, you have a wrong understanding of how you do your work. Yep. So understand you have a role to play. Colossians 3, 23, 24 says this. Whatever you do, what is whatever? Whatever means Whatever. Work at it with all your heart. How much is all? All. As working for whom? For the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Whatever role you have out there in the marketplace, in a family, in a marriage, in the marketplace, in the companies, you have been assigned by God. And if you understand you have been assigned by God, then you have a role to play there in Christ. And the values and the behaviors, the actions and the deeds and the thoughts and the attitudes that you carry is one that reflects Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, the scripture says, we are therefore Christ's ambassador as though God was making, were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. How can the world know People see Christ in and through you. And how can they see it when they meet you outside in the marketplace, when they see your family, when they see you in your marriage, when they see you in the roles in, within the structures that the world has. And that is so important for us. You know? And that's why the scripture tells us, come on, be the salt of the earth like of the world. That's the only way you can be in Christ. And that's what Colossians is. You are in Christ. And now that you are in Christ, you're no longer dictated by darkness, or by the things of this world, by the things of the flesh. Because your mind is set on things that are above. Therefore, put off, put on the good things of God, the fruit of the Spirit. And now that you, have, you, are being, you, you, you take all that God has for you, this is how you reflect to a world that needs to know in your relationship as wives and husbands, in your relationship as children and parents, in relationship as masters and slaves, boss and employee. In Christ. In Christ alone.
Let's pray. Father, we commit ourselves to you today. We we pray, Father, let us get this theology right in our own hearts that we are in Christ. In Christ and Christ alone, we are defined. The world might say a lot, certain things about us, might look down upon us, might view us differently. But it's in Christ we live, we move and have our being. It's in Christ that we are safe. That it's in Christ we have moved from darkness into His wonderful light. That it's in Christ we can live forevermore. And so Father, I pray that Lord, we, we capture this, know it, not just in our heads, but it brings a transformation in our hearts because we know it and that knowing brings a change that no longer I listen to myself and my flesh because they do not direct me but you Christ and your truth they direct me and so Lord how I engage the world daily in my workplace how I engage my family and how I engage my spouse how I engage others in the structures and organizations and setups in this world Lord you remind me Lord, it is only done in Christ and Christ alone. And so, Father, help me to walk with much wisdom and clarity, O oh Lord, because it is you that directs me, O oh Lord. It is you that leads me. It is you that inspires me. And so, Lord, Father, we just commit all our challenges to you today to know that, Lord, in you we can have the victory. In you we can find that strength. In you we find the sustenance. In you we have sufficiency. In you we find shelter. In you, Lord, we have your shield to cover us. In you, we have shalom that brings us wholeness and completeness. In you, we find order, not confusion. In you, we find healing and strength. In you, we have breakthrough and victory. And so today, Father, we commit our lives, we commit our marriage, our families, we commit our jobs, our workplace into your hands. Lord, let us be your soul of the earth and the light of the world to a world that needs to know your goodness and represent you well and live worthy, O oh Lord, of the work of the cross, pleasing unto your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Christ alone, let's stand. I place my trust. I find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ, in Christ alone, Lord, I place my trust. I find my glory in the power of the cross in every victory let it be said of me my source of strength my source of hope is Christ in every victory in every victory let it be said of me my source of strength my source of hope is christ alone in every victory let it be said of me my source of strength yes lord my source of hope is Christ alone. Father, we pray every word that we have sung today be a reality in our hearts. Lord, that it would shape our belief system that we are in Christ, that is in you, oh Lord, that determines who we are. Not what we do, not what we have, not what others might say, not what the world dictates, but what who you say we are in you that determines our lives that defines us that directs our path so teach us to set our minds on things that are above teach us to put off and put on the things that you have for us so that we can walk in this world being that ambassador for you now as you go go in his name 
go in Christ and be His soul of the earth and like the world. As you engage the world that needs to know His goodness, be His ambassador and carry that light to a world that needs to see all the more in this nation that it is Jesus that saves, it is Jesus that delivers, and it is in Christ that we have tomorrow. And now, may the love of the Father, grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Next Sunday, we have uh, Reverend Alexa Ho who will be coming and sharing the word. Do come and join us. God bless you.